and have your handout ready, and uh, we're going we're gonna to go through this passage. I, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we've been talking about suffering and trials and, and, and how that God, God doesn't send problems and suffering into our lives. He doesn't have to. Those things are going to come very naturally. We all go through problems. But we learn that God will use suffering and God will use problems to develop spiritual character in us, to, to change us, to grow and remember that remember the two words, grow and change, grow and change, grow and change. And God will grow and change us in the midst of problems. But there are some things that we can expect when we go through trials. There are some things that we can definitely expect when we go through trials, when we go through problems, when we go through suffering, when we go through pain, when we go through heartache, there are some definitely some things we learn here in this text that, that we can expect. Number one is this, and I, I want to dive right into it. So if you got your hand out, I want you to write this in. Number one, during trials, you can expect that your endurance will be tested. Your endurance will be tested. You know, verse 11 kind of ties in trials with endurance. Look at verse 11. He says, persecutions and afflictions. That literally means pain and hardship. The, the pain and hardship which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. <laughs> Three different cities he names. And then he says, what persecutions I endured. Say that with me. What persecutions I endured endured. Notice how it ties in trials with endurance. Paul said, Timothy, you know the hardship I endured. Endured. When I think of endurance, you know what I think of? I think of the dentist. Anybody in here ever have dental work done? Is that not a test of endurance? Amen. I had some stuff done recently and it wasn't even major dental work. And man, it just, I didn't think they were ever going to let me out of that chair. When I got home, I told my wife, I said, I've been through the great tribulation, let me tell you. I mean, it was horrible. Your endurance is tested, man. Well, when we go through trials and we go through problems in life, they have a way of teaching us the godly virtue of patience. Is patience a virtue? Yes or no? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Without patience, man, we'll run into all kinds of problems in our life. We've got to be patient. We've got to learn to wait on the Lord. And in your handout, look at that verse, Romans 5.3. It's in your handout. Uh, Paul said, we glory in tribulations. Why? Why? Why do you glory in problems? Knowing that tribulation works what? Patience. How many of you would agree with me that sometimes in life we create our own problems? Can I get an amen to that, huh? Yeah, sometimes we create our own problem. Not always. Sometimes problems just come and they just happen and there's nobody's fault. Nobody's, you know, it, 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 nobody to blame, right? But then there's times in my life I know when I've got problems in my life and it's, it's because of Dan, you know. It's stuff I did. And, and I think it's something that we've all been through, right, where, okay, we get impatient, we, we, we jump the gun, we make bad decisions, those bad decisions create problems. And then, what do we do? As believers, we pray, God help. God deliver me from this problem. God, I, God I, I need you to bail me out. Get me out of this, God. Well, I don't know about you, but I have found that God usually doesn't just swoop, swoop in and deliver me from the problem. Why doesn't God just swoop in and deliver us and eliminate the problem? Well, can you imagine, just imagine with me, if God bailed us out every time we jumped the gun and made a bad decision. What if God just jumped in and bailed us out? You know what we do, don't you? Keep making the same bad decisions over and over and over again. By the way, that's what many parents do with their kids. And it's because we love them, you know. I mean, I'm not saying that our heart's wrong at all. I'm a parent. I know. I got, I got kids now that are grown, you know. And, uh, in fact, you know, on the guitar there, Clayton, he's my middle son, many of you know. And, uh, you know, we do it with our kids where sometimes parents will, you know, every time their children, like when they're little, growing up, every time their children get in trouble, parents are going to run to their defense. Parents are going to make excuses for them. Parents are going to bail them out of every jam they ever get in. 
Then guess what? They grow up and they keep getting in jams. <laughs> And then you got to keep bailing them out, you keep bailing them out, you keep bailing them out. And you know what the result is? And again, you love them, you, you, your heart's right, but the result is that they never learn the lessons that they need to learn. How many of y'all have ever heard the expression, tough love? Right? Sometimes. You know what? God doesn't do that with His children. God doesn't eliminate all of our problems for us. God knows that problems are a teaching tool. To prepare us for future decisions. And we learn patience. And we learn long suffering. In fact, you know, I hate to say this. But how many of you would agree with this? We tend to grow the most spiritually when we go through problems. Would you all agree with that? It's in your handout. We tend to grow the most spiritually when we go through problems. We do, don't we? In fact, there's an example of that in your handout. Um, look with me in your handout at uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 three and four. These are real people just like us. And Paul writes to these people, this church at Thessalonica, and look what he says about them. He says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brothers, as it's fitting. He says, number one, because your faith is growing abundantly. Wouldn't that be great if we could say our faith is growing abundantly? And then he says, and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other. He says, man, your love is growing for each other. That's great. But what's the context of their love and their faith growing? Let's read on. He says, so we boast about you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you are, what? Enduring. We tend to grow the most when we go through problems. These people had tribulations, persecutions, and man, they were growing like crazy. But notice they were having to endure through those things. But they were learning a lot through those things. So when you go through problems, expect your endurance to be tested. Um, I told the uh, service before this, I said, you know, when we go through problems, a lot of times what can happen is we, we all tend to drift off course from where we need to be. Sometimes a problem comes into our life and it has a way of kind of jump-starting us and getting us where we need to be, kind of jump-starting us and getting us back on course where we need to be. And, and so that's a good thing. You know, some of you may be here today, and you're here because you're going through a trial, a problem. I had somebody tell me that. They said, man, it's like you were talking to me. I have people that think I spy on them, and then I'm preaching my message right at them, you know. And I know some of you think, he's preaching right at me today, you know, and I'm not. It's just the Holy Spirit taking that and using it. And uh, I had a lady come back to me. She's a first-time visitor today. She's like, it's my first time here, and she says, I'm going through a problem. I was raised up to know the Lord and to go to church. I drifted away, and she said, I'm here today because of a problem. She said, what do you know about me? No, I'm just kidding. She didn't say that. But she's like, man, that's just for me today. She said, it was like you were talking to me. And that's exactly what happens, though. Sometimes problems have a way of getting us back on course, you know. Number two, during trials, the second thing you can expect is that you can expect God's, write this in, deliverance. God's deliverance. You say, wait a minute. I thought you just said God isn't going to swoop in and deliver you. Well, it, this doesn't contradict the previous point. They, they connect. They, they go together. They complement. Because in your handout it says that we are delivered from so many trials by God giving us His grace to endure them to the end. Most things are seasonal. Most trials and problems eventually pass on their own anyway, and they're seasonal. So there's no supernatural deliverance, there's no lightning bolt, but we're delivered by God giving us the grace to endure it by, by patience. In fact, look at verse 11, and we'll see those two coincide together. Look at verse 11. Paul says, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I, and what's the next word, endured, and out of them all the Lord, what? Delivered me. So wait a minute. You may read that, and you may think, oh, the Lord delivered Paul from all his afflictions. God just swooped in and delivered him. Wait a minute. He names three cities. He says, I went through problems at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. He just mentions it in passing. Moving on. 
You can go back in the book of Acts and you can read what happened in every one of those cities. And do you know what happened? At Antioch, they contradicted and blasphemed against Paul when he preached the good news of Jesus. And they literally rode him out of town on a rail. I mean, humiliated the guy and threw him out of town. At Iconium, they planned an assault against Paul. And again, he had to flee for his life. At Lystra, they literally took Paul out in the street, picked up rocks, and brutally stoned him and left him for dead in the street. So what's the point? The point is, is that Paul was delivered from those trials, but it wasn't with a lightning bolt and God striking people dead and delivering Paul that way. No, he was delivered from those trials by enduring through those trials. He, and and here's, here's, here's a great statement, all right? He wasn't delivered from them. He was delivered through them. Are y'all with me? Come on now, y'all have had your coffee. Y'all with me, huh? <laughs> All right. He wasn't delivered from them, which is kind of what we think of. Whoop, God just whoop, swooped in. It took me out. He was delivered through them. I heard a song. I love song. I love music. And this song has such good words, and it's the same thought. Here's what it says. Listen to this. It says, this is one of the verses, he did not keep Noah from the flood that came. He didn't keep Moses from 40 years of pain. Now there was Daniel, Paul, and Silas, and the Hebrew boys, just to name a few. And when he did not keep them from, they knew that he would keep him, them through. And then the chorus says, he'll keep you through the fire when it becomes a furnace. He'll keep you through the waters when they become a flood. He would not make what he could not keep. He did not start what he can't complete. What he does not keep you from, he'll keep you through. And I thought, wow, that is exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes we think of deliverance as God swooping in and taking away the trial. But I want you to think about two examples with me of the Apostle Paul and when he went to prison for preaching the gospel for his faith. Two times Paul was in prison for preaching the the gospel. At Philippi, that city, you know what happened? An earthquake came, the doors of the prison flung open, and Paul and Silas ended up getting out of prison. This, that's how they were delivered. The second time, Paul went to a Roman prison, and he was delivered from that prison by means of death. Both times delivered. One, but again, he was delivered through. When a believer goes through a life and death trial, the good thing is, <laughs> praise the Lord, when we go through life and death trials as believers in Christ, we are in a win-win situation. So what do you mean? If we're delivered from the trial alive, then we can continue to serve God here on the earth. If we're delivered by the trial, if we're delivered from the trial by means of death, then we're in heaven with Jesus Christ. In fact, isn't that what Paul said? He's in prison. Look at this passage on the screen. He's in prison, okay? And in Philippians 1, he says, wait a minute. If I live through this, if I live, that's Christ. He says, in other words, if I live through this, I'm all about Jesus, and I'm going to be able to just live my life and glorify Him. He says, but if I die, that's gain. If I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I know not. He said, I'm going to straight between two. I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. And then the next verse, he says, nevertheless, to abide here on earth is more needful for you. So I can minister to you. Either way it goes, it's a win-win. Please understand that when we encounter problems today, when we, encounter, when we go through problems, we all go through problems. But when we go through problems... The display of God's power doesn't mean supernatural deliverance from the problem. I mean, even at Philippi, when I talked, when, remember I said he was in prison, an earthquake came. Even when the earthquake was over, Paul was still in prison. He didn't get out till the next day. So deliverance doesn't always mean God just taking away the trial. What he doesn't deliver us from, he'll deliver us through it. He'll bring us through it. He'll give us the grace to endure. In fact, look at this passage right here. Um, can we bring it up? Paul had a situation where 
he had a lot of privilege. He got to see Jesus. He got a lot of revelation from Christ. And it says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. That song, It Is Well With My Soul, talked about though Satan buffet me. It comes from that verse. Paul had Satan inflict upon him some thorn in the flesh. He's a little vague. We don't know what it was. We don't know if it was a chronic health issue. Some speculated he had eye problems. Uh, we don't know what it was, but it was some type of really just bad, you know, affliction. And then it says, uh, for this thing... I besought. In other words, for this thing, I prayed to the Lord three times that it might depart from me. God, deliver me. God, deliver me. God, deliver me. And then look at the next verse here. It says, and he said unto me, say it with you, say it with me, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, I'm not going to deliver you from, but I'm going to deliver you through this, Paul. My grace is going to be sufficient for you to get through this. Jesus said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul had a whole new perspective after that. He's like, you know what? I've learned to glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ will, may rest upon me. He said, I, I've, I've had, a new, I had an attitude adjustment. Paul says, I've learned to take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecution, distresses for Christ's sake. And then he said, you know why? I've learned to kind of, you know, embrace those things and not resent them. He said, because I've learned that when I got problems in my life and I got all these issues... He said, I'm, I'm weak physically, but I've learned to rely on Him. I've learned to trust Christ more. Uh, it's like we said, problems have a way of drawing us closer to Him. So he said, when I'm weak, he said, I've learned, then am I what? Strong. Then am I strong. God's power is displayed as He provides us the strength and the grace to endure the trial and to maintain a strong testimony and a strong faith through the trial. Which brings me to my last point. Number three, during trials, the third thing that you can expect is that others will be watching you. Other people will be watching you. Paul knew that Timothy had been carefully observing his life. Look at verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. He said, Timothy, you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Timothy knew what Paul was all about. How? How did Timothy know all about Paul? Because he watched Paul during these times of testing and trial. People, people learn a lot about us during problems, don't they? I've always contended that whenever I bring a staff member on to work here on our church staff, I always have contended this, because I've kind of learned this through the years, you never really know about a person until conflict comes. You really don't know about the character of a person until conflict comes. Then I know what I got as far as a staff member goes. Because anyone can be happy when everything's great, everything's hunky-dory, everything's kind of going your way, all the decisions that are made you love. Anyone can be happy then. The true test of a person is when they're going through trials, problems, conflict. That's when you find out what kind of person they really are. And whether we realize it or not, we're constantly being watched by other people. Especially during times of trial and testing. Many times what they see from us and what they, what they hear from us during these times of testing and trials, it's going to determine whether or not they're interested in our faith. Not only are unbelievers watching us and affected by our attitude in trials, guess what? Other believers are also impacted. They're watching you, and they are impacted for good or for bad. Young Christians watch older Christians to see how they respond in trials. In fact, in your handout, look at Philippians chapter number 1. Look at your handout. Paul's in prison, right, for preaching the gospel. And look what he says. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that the things which happened to me, talking about being in prison, being arrested, he said, they have resulted in advancing the gospel. 
so that my imprisonments in Christ have become known throughout the entire palace garden to all the rest. And a great many of the brothers in the Lord, having become confident because of my incarcerations, right, my trouble, my problems, they have dared to speak the word without fear. Another great example are the Thessalonian believers. Look at the next passage in your handout. Paul writes to them, he says, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word, notice this, in much affliction. These people were going through a lot of problems with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. These people, they were going through great affliction, yet it provided a powerful platform for them to get the word out, to share Christ with other people. In your handout, it says that many times our trials will open up a door for us to help other people, to minister to other people. God can take those problems that we encounter, and God can use them for His glory and for the help of other people. I want to play for you a video that I found that I really like. And the reason why I love this video so much is it kind of looks at things from a kid's perspective. This little girl's probably junior high, you know, seventh grade, maybe sixth grade. And, and, it, and she got a whole new perspective on problems and trials. And so watch this video. There are days when the pain is a lot to carry. And the ones who are supposed to love you end up hurting you the most. Everything inside you wants to run, to hide, to escape. And sometimes that's how you cover the pain. But that's not how scars work. They run deep. And so you pretend everything's okay. But the pain doesn't stop. I think pretending just makes it worse. Until you realize you're not alone. Other people are broken too. And they need someone to help. Someone who knows what it feels like. Who's walked through it. The pain can scar you. But it also changes the way you look around yourself. At the world. At people. Because no one's too broken for grace. That's what makes it grace. Nobody's too broken for grace. You believe that? Say amen, huh? And you know, she said it changes. She said when, when you, you know, they need someone who knows what they're going through. There are many people who are closed to the gospel. They don't want to hear about God. They don't want to hear about Jesus. But they'll listen to a person who has been through a similar problem as them. There's an immediate connection because of a common trial that has been endured. And it, and it gives that believer 
an opportunity, a platform with which to be able to speak to them about the Lord. It's like, you know, you can take someone who's just closed, they don't want to hear it, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh wow, you've been through a divorce too? Oh, you've been through this same health problem? Oh, you went through the death of a loved one like this? You mean you had an addiction like this? You went through child abuse? You had financial problems? Maybe, maybe it's incarceration. It's like, man, you've been in jail? You know, sometimes Christians are like afraid to admit that, like, you know, that they've been in jail or they've been in prison. Let me tell you something. Praise the Lord for, for people that will take the things that they've been through and use them as a bridge to be able to help other people that need Jesus that are going through the same things. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Maybe you've dealt with depression. Maybe you've had marital problems and marital issues. God can take those things and use them to help another human being, to help somebody else. In your handout, it says there that trials can give us a very powerful platform to speak for Christ. Some of us have been through some gut-wrenching things that... Nobody would blame us, you know, if, if we decided to just kind of pack it in, quit, give up. But as believers, we can decide that even in our pain and grief, that we're going to find ministry opportunity through our problems. We're going to use these things as an opportunity to, to help another human being, to help someone else, help them through it or help them find Christ through that. You see, here's the bottom line. And, and this is what I want you to get. And this is what we talked about the last two weeks. In your problems, God desires to do a work in you. He wants to deepen your relationship with Him and grow and change you. Okay, but hold on. Not only does God want to do a work in you, but He also des desires to do a work through you. He wants, to, you. he wants to be able to take your problems and be able to use them to help somebody else. I was telling in the 8.30 service uh, this morning, we had a couple that was sitting right here on the second row. And the couple that was sitting here uh, is named John and Linda. Some of you know them. And John and Linda head up our Grief Share Ministry, which is a ministry to help people that have gone through the, the death of a loved one. And um, so many people, multitudes of people have gone through. Our, our Grief Share meets every Monday night. Literally all year long. John and Linda said, they don't even usually take off anything for holidays because they're like, hey, grief doesn't take a holiday. And so John and Linda are faithful every Monday night to lead our grief share to help people who are hurting. But what you may not know about John and Linda is that John and Linda went through something so heartbreaking and so just gut-wrenching. And I walked with them through that. They lost their 40-year-old son to cancer, and it was horrible. And their, their son, they believe he contracted this uh, cancer uh, defending our country in Iraq, and he came in contact with chemicals and so forth and ended up getting cancer, dying at 40 years old. Let me tell you something. John and Linda understand what grief is all about. But they decided to take that pain, take that problem, and use it to help other people. And that's what I'm talking about. Even Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas are in prison. Remember at Philippi, I told you they were in prison for preaching the gospel. But guess what ends up happening? They end up being able to lead the jailer. The guy who is, who is guarding them in jail, he's going to kill himself. When the earthquake comes, Paul and Silas were able to lead him to Jesus Christ. And here they got blood all over their backs from being beaten. They got their own problems, but they're able to help him. And in your handout, it says that when circumstances are the darkest, that's when God's power and light can shine the greatest. Look through your Bible. When you see God's power on display, it usually started with a problem. It usually started with a problem or a deep trial. So I want you to take hope. You may be here today and you're like, Pastor Dan, I don't even know that I know God. I don't know anything about God. You know, I don't know any, Jesus Christ. That's just a, 
That's just a curse word. I don't even know anything about Jesus. I don't know him. Listen, how many of you would agree with me on this statement? God has made it possible through his word to know for sure that we're going to go to heaven when we die. Do you believe that? Do you believe that it's possible to know that you have eternal life? Do you believe that? Yes. The Bible tells us how. So if you're here today, and if you die today, and you're not sure that you have eternal life, you're not sure you'd be in heaven, when the service is over, come by our hospitality room over here to my right, or uh, come by, see one of our pastors in the foyer. We would love to be able to take the Bible and show you how you can know God today. Let's bow our heads right now and close our eyes.